So welcome to Attracting Bluebirds. My name is Sarah Gladue. I'm the Director of Education and Citizen Science for Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust. And it's wonderful that so many folks are interested in attracting bluebirds. They certainly are special and obviously they hold a special place for, for lots of people. Uh, those of you who are just logging in now are welcome to go into the chat and put in your name and where you are. It's fun to know where folks are from. People are from all around the area, including Southport and Rockport and Damascata. So keep doing that. You can also use the chat for any questions that come up. I'll try to monitor the chat and um, my colleague, Angela DeVoe, also in the education department at, Conservation Tr at uh, Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust, uh, we'll be monitoring the chat and we'll try to make sure we get to everybody's questions. Um, so that's great. Um, so attracting bluebirds. Can everybody see my cursor and my shared screen with the slide? I just need to, yes. if you could, some people nod their heads, that would be great, yep. or, or shake. Okay, yep. good. <laughs> Excellent. Now I have to figure out why. There we go. So today's talk, we are going to focus um, at first a little bit about bluebirds and what they are, what, what distinguishes them from other birds. And we will talk about feeding them specifically. Uh, generally, that's a wintertime um, proposition. Sheltering bluebirds, both in the summer and the winter. Um, those are good ways to provide for the birds. And we'll end up with some uh, resources for you uh, that we'll send. We'll have a little bit short list on at the end of the slide. Uh, the recording will be made available to you and any other additional resources we talk about will also be uh, emailed to you uh, um, in an email. So you'll, you'll have that, um, all that information. For some reason, my screen doesn't want to advance. There we go. Um, so bluebirds, these are Eastern bluebirds as compared to the Western bluebirds. The Eastern bluebirds of this area are thrushes and they're similar to many other thrushes around the world, including our American robin, veeries, hermit thrushes. They're kind of a heavy bodied bird. They focus usually on eating insects, but they will also um, go ahead and eat other things and mostly berries at other times of the year. So um, most thrushes are, are important seed distributors in the shoulder seasons. So robins right in that picture, but bluebirds also are eating berries shoulder season, um, spring and, and especially in the fall and other, and other fruits and so forth. So let's start off with what do bluebirds eat? They are generally eating insects off of the ground. They're, they're flying, you watch them, um, as I'm sure many of you do around your homes, they're flying down to the ground, grabbing something on the ground and flying up to a post or a perch and eating it or taking it to the birdhouse and feeding it to their young. And so this would be mainly beetles, maybe mainly different varieties of ground beetles, but also crickets and grasshoppers and other ground dwelling insects. The secondarily, they're also going to be eating snails and grubs and caterpillars in particular are very important for the young birds. And actually that's image of the, of the nestlings with the parent feeding the, the small um, caterpillar. That's what they're gonna feed the young ones. And this speaks to the importance of caterpillars, which is complicated because humans right now, especially um, in this area, I guess, are having a love-hate relationship with caterpillars. We don't like the brown-tailed moth caterpillars. And we, uh, and, and, and believe me, I've had those rashes and I don't like them either. <laughs> but um, some of the chemicals that we use for caterpillar control um, also have the potential to impact the birds. Flying insects like moths and termites are less of a, of a food source and it's mostly that they're eating those when they're on the ground, when those insects are on the ground, they're grabbing them. Um, it's, it's not that they're generally hawking or hawking is when a bird flies into the air and grabs an insect out of the air to eat. Berries, sumac, holly, dogwoods, pokeweeds, um, all in the wintertime and fall small tree and vine fruits, including the grapes and cherries in the winter time. So a pretty diverse um, selection of food uh, types that they, are, that they are consuming in the course of a, 
of a season or a year. So one of the things I like folks to think about is if you are attracting bluebirds, but also generally for wildlife at large, a good a good place to start might be produce uh, shrubs that produce berries that these birds will eat. And then in the course of that, you're also of course gonna be providing for the pollinators because the flowers are gonna be useful for pollinators and, uh, and other birds and, and other varieties of wildlife that are going to be looking for, for berries. So some of the berries that we know the bluebirds will eat include the short list here and um, they and they're pretty diverse about what they'll eat. So they will they'll find um, quite a few different berries in the area, something that they can eat. And these are all native shrubs, and um, you'll find them uh, throughout the area. Some some nurseries are beginning to carry more and more native shrubbery and um, and and native varieties. So so. Feeding bluebirds, it sounds like a few of you are already doing that and have discovered that they do love mealworms. They will also eat suet and soaked raisins um, because they do eat fruit and hulled black oiled sunflowers and then either live or dried mealworms. If you're not familiar with feeding mealworms, a good way to do this is to use a, any kind of a bird feeder that has kind of a tray and you just put a handful um, in the tray and the birds will find it. It is amazing how it doesn't take very long if the birds are anywhere in the area for them to find the food sources that you have left out. Bluebirds like a fairly open feeling bird feeder. So if you have something that requires them to go in or um, feel enclosed, they're less likely to be accessing the food on a regular basis. If you have something that's a, a tray feeder that's open, plexiglass like the one shown in the image here, where they can see around them, they're more likely to, to go for it. And then the bottom image shows the bluebirds eating right off, off the suet basket, and they'll, they'll, they will do that as well. Um, they especially like mealworms. And then a bird bath is a great way to attract the not only bluebirds, but other birds as well. Um, and they do, they do enjoy a good bath. So let's talk a little bit here about um, where they'll naturally nest. So in terms of getting into what the nesting requirements are for these birds, they, these, the bluebirds are cavity nesters. So they are looking in the wild, they're looking for a hollowed out tree with a hole already in it. So a hole that has um, a, you know, that's the entry area for the tree. And they want that snag of a tree or, or stump or um, par portion of a tree to be out in the open. They, they like a really open area, um, something that is 50 to 200 feet even from any tree line or shrubbery you know, clump of shrubs or anything, they like it very wide open. Um, as compared to chickadees and wrens who will use a similar opening in a tree, a tr similar cavity, but they don't require it to be open all the way around. Um, they don't mind nesting a chickadee or a wren and so forth. We'll, we'll, they'll nest on the edge. They'll nest if there's like a clump of trees with some shrubbery nearby and a dead tree in the middle. Um, chickadees and, and wrens will, will nest in there, or nuthatches are another one that will nest in a place like that. Whereas the tree swallows and the bluebirds really want the open area. Um, they like ideally a hole that's about an inch and a half across. That's gonna limit the predators. And um, they, you know, they don't want to have, um, they know, <laughs> that if they have a big opening, it also can allow a big predator or a raccoon to stick its you know, hand, its, its paw way inside there and they will avoid a hole that's too big. And of course a hole that's too small, they simply can't get into. So it really has to be about the right size, the right habitat. Um, bluebirds like short mowed grass when they can find a place like that because they're picking the insects up off the ground. So they just, they can see them better. They can find them better. So 
um, the shorter the grass, the, the more they like it. But I have to say, I, I think that it's um, probably going to be important for you to be balancing that short mode grass with the needs of other wildlife too. So. So if you're putting up shelters that you've made for them, bird boxes, some of the important things, of course, include the location, um, 50 to 200 feet from anything is going to be important, and the short grass. The box itself that you're creating uh, needs to have a couple of aspects that are that you pay attention to. Um, one is that it, the venting is important because if, you, if it gets too hot, um, you have more issues with parasites and the birds also just from overheating can get stressed. That's less of an issue in Maine, but it does happen sometimes, especially for those birds. Sometimes they'll have two broods in a, in a season. And so those birds that are nesting uh, late in the season, they maybe raised a, a brood, they're nesting again, and they're sitting in that box brooding, you know, in late August. Um, or even in early August, it can be pretty hot. So that's that's a consideration. Access for you to be able to clean the birdhouse out. For example, you don't wanna have um, mice and other rodents, squirrels are notorious for this as well. Getting in there, setting up housekeeping um, through the winter, and then um, that will deter the birds the next spring. They'll also often chew on the hole or chew on other parts of the wood and potentially damage the, the birdhouse. So you do wanna have a way for you to get into the birdhouse, um, either through some kind of swinging hinging door or panel that you can unscrew, and then you can clean the birdhouse out. The counting of the birds is something that you, we'll talk about more later in the class, but it uh, one one option you have is to, be monitoring the birds as they are um, developing in the nest. And you can, you can count the baby birds while they're in the nest if you know how to do that. And you can kind of monitor their, their growth and help make sure that you're keeping an eye on predators and documenting what happens so that if there are problems the following year, you can try to mitigate those. Um, we'll talk about monitoring bluebird houses in a little while. Drainage, you want to have a roof that um, overhangs the hole so significantly so that you don't have a driving rain that gets into the box. You want to make sure that the drainage in the floor, that there are actually holes um, so that if there, any moisture does get in there, it's, it's able to drain out again. And then predator protection, both on the pole itself and on the hole. So, um, I think I have some images of some of this. Um, so here's some boxes and um, I'll, I'll show you another image in, in a few minutes, but um, the if you can see the hole for both of these bird boxes, it has actually a secondary piece of wood that's set over it so that it's further, it's, it's kind of um, the hole is brought out and that makes it so that it's harder for a squirrel or a raccoon to reach into the bottom of the box and grab something like a baby bird. The other thing that sometimes people do is they take a great big washer, a metal washer that's an inch and a half in opening, or um, they, they actually make copper rings and they set those over the holes. And that is a way to stop rodents in particular from chewing on the holes and making the holes bigger. Uh, that's something that squirrels and mice will sometimes do. <clears throat> so, um, so these are a couple of plans. You can find all kinds of plans online. And that's why I wanted to sort of make sure I showed you some of the basics of what's important to look for if you are either buying a kit or making your own or, um, or purchasing. Uh, you want to kind of be aware of the needs in terms of venting and um, predators and um, and making sure that there's no moisture in there, protecting them from, from uh, disease and so forth. So, and heat exposure. So these are a couple of different bird box designs. Um, both of these are fairly popular. There's a lot of similarities. 
tree swallows will use the same bird houses as bluebirds. So you can, and we'll talk about that more in a few moments, but um, you can expect that, that you might get uh, tree swallows as well. And um, both of these houses, you know, they're, they have many of the same attributes, but one of the big differences between this is the box that is taller, uh, it's further for a predator to reach into. It also is um, better vented in the sense that there's, um, there's a better opportunity for air to get above the birds and then vent out. Um, but there are many, many different bird uh, house options and, um, and many of them work pretty well. So. so one thing to think about with respect to providing um, the bird boxes for the summer is you may want to at the same time be able to create wintering roost boxes. So a winter roost box is a box that birds can roost in in the winter when the weather is really severe. Normally in the, in the wild, these birds would be roosting in a, in a hole in a tree, in a cavity. And um, as we kind of manicure our lawns and take away some of those opportunities for birds to find tree cavities, one way to help replace that habitat for them is to provide winter roost boxes. The difference between a winter roost box and a summer nesting box is, as you can see, the hole is on the bottom. The bird walks in, climbs in, and then jumps up onto a, 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 um, a little perch to be able to roost through the winter, through the night. And, um, and they'll often do this in little groups and little family groups. And so you can have a little family uh, cozying up inside the birdhouse. The reason the hole is on the bottom is so that the birds um, can climb up in the birdhouse, the warm air rises and the birds are in the warmest portion of the birdhouse. So there actually are um, plans for birdhouses and winter roost boxes where you can take a summertime nesting box and convert it into a wintertime roosting box. And I'll show you at the end of the, of the slideshow, um, a Woodworking for Wildlife kind of book that has uh, plans for this. Uh, and you can, I think, probably also go online and find options for this as well. But it's just a neat way to provide not only for bluebirds, but for other birds and to um, kind of round out the use of, of any bird uh, box that you're putting up. And you'll notice that a couple of these bird houses or bird boxes on this page do have metal plates. And that, again, is to stop the rodents from being able to chew into that. So I just want to reiterate, if folks have questions, um, feel free to put them into the chat and I'll try to answer them as I go along. Um, let's see. So a little bit more about predator pro um, protection. We, we, we can see the, the built out entry area and that's one way to stop the animals from being able to reach in. And then another way is just to simply be able to prevent them from going up the pole at all with a couple of different types of baffles or um, something slick uh, like turtle wax so that they just physically can't climb up the, a metal pole, for example. Um, so there's a number of different types of either can baffles or the flatter baffles, and you can attach those onto a wooden post or a metal post. There's many different designs. Um, and that will just stop any kind of snake or uh, raccoon or squirrel or anything like that. They all will go up and take uh, eggs and sometimes nestlings if they have the opportunity to do so. So here's a couple um, images of the nests themselves in the box. And um, you can kind of get a sense here of the different types of nests the different birds will build. So you've got um, over on one side, you've got a fine uh, grassy nest with a few other little tiny thin twigs uh, and blue eggs. This is going to be the bluebird nest. And then in the top right, you've got a, a house wren and they fill the box with sticks. So, you know, if you happen to find a, uh, a 
a nest after the season is over, for example, and let's say you didn't know what nested in a particular box, you can often identify what it was that nested. And then in the bottom right, you've got a, a tree swallow and they will mark their nests with white feathers. So if you find a, a nest box that's got white feathers in it, that was taken by a, by a tree swallow. So people often comment, well, how, how do we make sure that we provide nest boxes for tree swallows and bluebirds? And the trick is to just pair the, pair the boxes because while bluebirds won't nest generally right within um, close proximity to other bluebirds and tree swallows won't nest in close proximity to tree swallows, they will nest in close proximity to the other species. And part of the reason for this is they're not feeding on the same insects for the most part. The bluebirds are eating the insects off the ground and the tree swallows are hawking insects out of the air. And so they're not even competing for the same food. So they can, they can be sure that they're gonna be able to um, provide for their, for their baby, for their offspring and, and nest in close proximity. That one image is a little unusual where you have one pole where you and, and you've got a box for each um, right on the same pole. I wouldn't recommend that, you could try it, but I, I, it's unlikely that that will happen, that you have tree swallows and bluebirds so close to each other. They're, they're more, it's more common to spread them out, you know, anywhere between 10 and 25 feet, uh, like, the, like the bottom middle image. And um, again, this will give you some other ideas for different designs of different boxes different baffles to protect them from predators and just the arrangement to be able to allow for tree swallows and bluebirds. In general, what seems to happen, and this is not always the case, but often what happens is the male birds um, come back and start claiming the nest boxes and often it's tree swallows who will return first. Now we do have, um, as you, many of you have noted, we do have wintering bluebirds here. And so this may, uh, this may change the situation somewhat, but in general, the tree swallows will claim a nest box first, and then there's that that, that a lot. This kind of arrangement, this pairing, allows for the bluebirds to be able to find a, an open nest box, most likely, um, especially if it's in the open. If it's not in the open, then you are likely to have more competition from wrens and um, chickadees and nuthatches and so forth. So. So um, somebody asked in the chat um, that she doesn't see a lot of bluebirds in her woodsy grass, lots of birds area. Um, how do we attract them in the first place? So the, the, um, the answer to that is habitat. And, and in general, um, if, you, if you don't have any open area in your vicinity, you are unlikely to attract bluebirds um, if you have, you know, an opening, a big open area across the street, the neighbors, for example, or something have a, have a big, uh, field, uh, you may be able to successfully get them to come over and, and feed and eat from a feeder, even if you're not able to get them to nest on your property. So if you're trying to attract bluebirds and you haven't seen them in your, in your region, um, if you have open grassy area and, and it's sometimes at least mowed short, uh, and you, are, you are likely to eventually get bluebirds if you put out food um, and or put out bird feeders, uh, sorry, bird houses. Um, if you don't have any open grassy areas, you're, you're, you are less likely to attract them. Let's see. So, one of the other things about um, birds is that there's a number of nest parasites, and I'm not actually talking about insects, although that happens as well. But there are nest parasites that are other species of birds that will take advantage of uh, good habitat and a nest site in order to uh, raise their own young. And so what happens is um, if you have birdhouses that are a bit close to buildings or um, you are providing bird food that attracts sparrows, European sparrows. They like millet, for example, that very small round food. Um, 
you may be attracting other birds. And, uh, and, and there are a few species that will um, parasitize bluebird nesting sites. So what happens is um, with the European sparrow, which is that pair of sparrows up in the top center of um, the slide there, they will do a couple of things. One thing they'll do is come into a bluebird box, destroy the eggs, um, and, and use the nest site for themselves. Another thing that they may do is um, they will actually kill fledgling or um, uh, newly hatched or fledgling um, bluebirds as well, and then take over the site, the nest site. European sparrows, I'm sorry, European uh, starlings, which are is that, that pretty iridescent bird in the middle there um, with its wings open is a starling and they have those spots all over them. Uh, they're more, they're easier to exclude because they're a bit bigger of a bird. So you just want to have, um, you make sure that your holes on your bird box are, are no more than an inch and a half across. And then you're, you'll be successful in, t in eliminating starlings from taking over. These are both um, non-native species. And um, so it is actually, if you find that they are nesting in your blue bird box and you want to remove, I'm sorry if you hear dog barking, but if you want to remove um, the nests, it is legal to do that. You, these are not protected that by the Migratory Bird Act. And um, you just have to be sure that you know the difference between a European um, sparrow and, and other birds, for example, and same with the, with the starling. The birds over on the right side of the slide are cowbirds and they do a super interesting thing. They will, uh, the female will deposit her egg um, into the bluebird and, and other birds, other species as well. But they'll put their egg right into the nest um, of the nesting female. The, the bluebird will raise that cowbird baby as if it was her own. But because the cowbird um, fledg uh, nestling is bigger, it will generally outcompete the littler bluebirds. And so, um, the cowbird will be more successful. It will be grow up healthier. Oftentimes the bluebird babies don't make it because they're trying to compete with the cowbird. The cowbird is a, a native species. So it is protected by the Migratory Bird Act. So you, you actually can't do anything about this. Um, it's just something to do to know about and um, uh, and just to be just to be aware of the, that it that this is something that can happen. And um, let's see. Uh, somebody, a couple other questions. Let me um, let me attend to the questions that are coming up as they come. Do the winter roosting boxes also need to be located in the pen? Uh, oh, in the open, probably. Um, the winter nesting boxes actually um, they don't need to be in the in the open as much. They the bluebirds will nest in a, or will roost, sorry, in the winter in a box that is say on the edge of the woods or on the edge of your yard area. So it doesn't need to be so much in the open. Um, somebody asked, how often should we check the box um, to remove a non uh, bluebird nest? Usually my advice there is to just watch the box, maybe as far away as you reasonably can, perhaps with binoculars, so that you're not, um, stressing out at any birds that are that you <laughs> that you're trying to attract. So if you go ahead and and um, and kind of it, it's not that you have to do it on a particular schedule. It's just as much as you want to just be watching to see uh, what birds are going in and out of the. <laughs> Sorry, my husband just came home and the dogs are yapping. So if you can. Um, So let's see. Another question is um, that they want, somebody's asking about discouraging swallows. They take over the bluebird nests and they've watched them pin a bluebird to the ground and attack it and so forth. Um, there really isn't anything you can do about that. Uh, swallows are a bird that's also protected by the Migratory Bird Act. So 
um, they are they are protected as well. It's sometimes not fun to watch that sort of behavior, but um, I I would say that it's a sign that you have a desirable, uh, very de desirable uh, habitat if you've got birds attacking each other, um, and that maybe if you can encourage uh, neighbors and friends to put up birdhouses in the vicinity, maybe you'll lessen the, the competition. Uh, and maybe that will help provide more homes for swallows and bluebirds. Somebody is asking about the direction of the opening of the bluebird house. And that's a great question. Um, they, you, they're pretty tolerant of uh, birdhouses being directed in different areas, but south is generally what's recommended. South or east is the general recommendation. But it's more important to direct them towards an open area. So if you have a bit of habitat, maybe towards the bottom of a field or something that is a little bit um, getting closed in because maybe trees are co um, coming in on the edge of the field, encroaching on the edge of the field, you may want to just direct the birdhouse towards the field just so that the bluebirds are attracted to that site. Um, east or south is the, is the best, best bet. Um, a little bit of information about a winter box care. So you do want to prop the, op the, um, the panel that opens, you want to prop that open so that you don't attract mice like in this image, because the mice will, will destroy the box. They make it um, pretty uninhabitable by the birds. And so um, you just want to discourage them by, by not making a nice place for them to live by, by opening the box and making repairs. Um, you may find that some of the wood pieces will split over time. You may need to, um, you know, replace parts of it and so forth. So check that your baffle is still intact, that sort of thing. And so uh, just a little bit about monitoring nest boxes. This is an image of a woman monitoring a pair of nest boxes. And she looks like she's, maybe this is the end of the season. It looks like fall, the, late fall, the, the grasses have died back and she's taking out an old nest. It looks like a wren nest actually out of that box. So there's a, you know, there's, there's the, the beginning of the season where you close the box up because it's been open all winter. There's the end of the season where you want to clean out the box and prop open the door. And then there are um, a number of programs that teach people how to monitor bluebird boxes through the, through the season. And um, one thing that's fairly easy to do without a whole lot of training is if you see a family of bluebirds and you know that the fledglings have all left that nest box, um, you know, this might be the end of June, early July, you should go ahead and clean out that box because frequently, as I think I mentioned before, the birds will go back and they'll they will um, nest again. It may not be the same pair, could be, but it's not necessarily. But the, the birds are much more likely to use it if there's no nest in it. So if you see the family leave, you know that they have gone off, go ahead and clean out the box. Um, if you do clean out a box, you may see the eggshell pieces from the nest. And um, this image is just a little bit of a, um, a, an idea of what different uh, nest or different eggs look like and the different coloration. Tree swallows are not usually that pink. They're kind of, they tend to be a little pink on the top and the bottom, um, a little speckly looking and then more white throughout. But that's a general idea. So you also, if you don't see the birds nesting, you may be able to go to the box after the fact and find the eggshells and know what was making a nest in there, which is pretty fun to do. Um, if you are interested in, net, in um, nest box monitoring through the actual growth of the birds. The, the thing to be most concerned about is that you don't want to open the nest box at a time when the babies are at the point where they can jump out of, um, that they can jump and they can jump out of the nest. Because what happens is if you inadvertently open the nest box and the fledglings are old enough to be able to jump out then um, they may do so. And then you have, you know, you've just, you've really disturbed the nest more than you would have intended to. So 
and you can kind of get an idea right from this Bluebird um, growth chart that uh, I found at the North American Bluebird Society website. So, you know, you've got the eggs and then for the first six days, these birds don't even have, don't even, they, they have, you know, gaping <laughs> mouths and, the, and no, no feathers really until um, close to seven, day seven. And then they're starting to grow feathers and they do start to get stronger. So I tell people not to open the nest box after about day nine. Um, so if you know when the nest uh, eggs were, were laid um, and you know when the female started to sit on them, you can, you can give, get a good idea. But the reality is if you've done a good job of um, keeping an eye on the birdhouse um, before the egg, eggs are even laid, that is to say, you know there's no European sparrow in there that you want to extract. Um, there's probably no important reason to be opening the box. Um, and um, sometimes people do this in order to be able to monitor them so that they are getting an idea if, for example, predators are a problem. So that, that would be the only, if you suspect that there is predation going on, you think that you're only, you're re repeatedly only seeing a couple of fledglings fledge from a nest box, you can start to suspect that predation may be going on because generally speaking, you're gonna have between four and six babies out of every, every um, brood. Um, so, um, somebody asks, um, is now soon enough or too late to clean out a nest box? Go ahead and clean out your nest box now. The birds are starting to claim them but it is not too late. So go ahead, <coughs> excuse me, go ahead and clean them out. And the height of the box. Um, so the height of the box is actually not terribly important. Uh, the only reason most people put the bird boxes at um, four to six feet high is because that's kind of the best viewing for humans. But there's no particular reason the birds um, will nest, you know, 20 feet up in the air and sometimes, um, they'll nest lower, but that does raise the issue. If, you, if you're much lower than four feet, squirrels especially can jump to the nest box. And that means that you have um, the potential for the predators to get in there. So you don't want them much below four feet, but. Um, uh, somebody asked, uh, bluebirds prefer to have, do per, bluebirds prefer to have a pine tree nearby for using the needles? And have I seen this to be true? Um, I do frequently see pine needles in the nests. I, I don't think it's a requirement. Um, and to be honest, I would be hard pressed to find a place in Maine where there aren't pine needles fairly available. Um, so if you don't have a pine tree right at your house, I don't think that would be a problem because very likely nearby in the neighborhood, you're going to have a pine tree. Um, So here's a couple of resources for you. Um, the Bluebird book by the Stokes um, is a great one. It tells you all about bluebirds. And let's see, the Audubon Birdhouse book is a great one. It's a fairly new book. And actually they just put out a new edition of this. I know Alyssa Wolfson, um, she's actually Steve Cress's uh, wife, uh, Steve Kress is the person responsible for reintroducing puffins back to Maine. And um, this is a great book. And I put the Woodworking for Wildlife from the um, Minnesota DNR uh, in this list because it's a book that I used to use quite a lot and it's very helpful. Uh, it, and one of the plans that it has in it is this plan for the um, for the winter roost box, summer nesting box conversion. Um, so that's great. Um, somebody asked about wood chips uh, of any kind in the boxes. And, and no, I don't think you need to put wood chips in the boxes. The, these birds are making nests only out of um, grasses and um, a few stocky weeds occasionally. 
and occasionally and, and certainly uh, pine needles they'll use as well to some degree so i don't think you need to have any ch wood chips of any kind in the in the boxes to make the birds um inclined to use them uh, and in terms of additional information that you can find easily on the web, one place to go is the North American Bluebird Society. And they have a great um, website with all kinds of information, images, information about monitoring bluebird houses, which we don't really have time to get into that whole process um, this evening. And then we also, um, the, the um, Oh, there's the website right there, nabluebirdsociety.org. So that's that's really the best place to go for online information. Um, so somebody asks about what did bluebirds use for shelter before we manufactured the the boxes, and the the natural site is those dead snags um, that have been hauled out by generally by woodpeckers with inch and a half holes. That's what they prefer. And um, a number of our woodpeckers will make make holes about that side. Yes, uh, somebody points out that Woodworking for Wildlife is out of print. Um, I have found a few copies online uh, used, so you might be able to find it that way. But the alternative would be the Audubon Bluebird House book, because that does have great plans in it as well. But thanks for putting that out. Um, Good. We folks had some great questions. You can welcome to keep them coming. If you have additional questions, I'm happy to entertain them. Um, and uh, you're also, um, yeah, there we go. Um, you're welcome to unmute yourself and just speak up if you wish as well. Sarah, hey, I have a question. Oops, go ahead. Oh, you go ahead. You started first. Um, a bunch of us started this meeting a few minutes early, and there were at least 25 of us, and it got off to a rocky start. Um, and some some of us just left the meeting, and I, for some reason, I just decided to leave the meeting and click on your link and found the meeting already going somewhere else. So this was a little confusing. So. Is there a chance this is being recorded so we could look at it again? It is, and I apologize for confusion. Um, I'm not sure what happened. There may have been more than one link available. I, I also, frankly, was concerned about that because I found something that was inconsistent. Um, but at any rate, yes, it, it is being recorded. And if for any reason I failed to record it, which I don't think I did, but that happened last time, um, I will offer the program again because there's no reason why not to. It's it's uh, I'm happy to do it, but there will be a recording. It should be sent to you. A link will be sent to you shortly. So thanks for asking, Judith. Sarah, so I know that you said to, to have like two houses fairly close together for um, the the swallow and the the bluebirds, but yep. how far if you want to have multiple houses up available for bluebirds, how far apart should they be? Um, in general, you can put them about 100 feet apart, 100, 120 feet apart, and that will be sufficient. So for example, if you have a pair of, of houses for the two species of birds, and then 100 feet apart, you have another pair of bird houses for okay. another pair of families, that should be good. Great, thank you. Sure. Oh, and somebody um, made the comment about where can you get mealworm cakes that go in the wire suet basket? And somebody says um, they have them on Amazon. Um, so that's one option. I have also seen them at some hardware stores and feed supply stores. And incidentally, if somebody is interested in getting a huge quantity of mealworms, like an enormous bag of them, um, dried mealworms can be purchased that way at feed supply stores. Probably Ames and Wiscasset has it. I'm pretty sure that the RZR um, heart, uh, store in um, on Route okay. 1 in Walderboro has it. Thank but you. people feed them to their chickens, for example, as well. So if you're looking for a large bag of mealworms, you can sometimes get it from a 
feed supply store. And Anne says that she made a good bluebird feeder by using a small saucer and a 12 inch hanging rope and she's placed it under the eaves of a porch right on the edge. It's very popular with the bluebirds as the bigger birds like robins cannot get to the feeder. Yeah, I find that experimenting with kind of where certain groups of birds are like likely and happy to go is a way to kind of um, you know feed one group of birds and then you could feed the robins elsewhere or you could feed you know if you can if you want to kind of tailor who you're feeding and where that's great Anne. thank you well thank you very much everybody i'm really pleased that you were able to make this program I'm sorry for folks who um, had a confusing uh, time getting onto this program, but we'll send out the we'll send out the link and see what what we can do in the way of um, catching everybody up. So, thank you, Sarah. That was very helpful. Oh, good. Glad to. Thank hear you. That. Thank you very much. My my pleasure. Have a great evening, everybody.